Yo, what's up, y'all? This is Terrence J. Hollywood, you good? I'm checking in with all my friends, my family, my loved ones to see what's happening out there in the world. And right now, there's nobody I love more than my dog. He is a super director, super producer. He's a writer, amazing creative. And he thinks he still has one of the illest jump shots. I don't know. I don't know how the jump shot looks right now. I haven't seen you crazy. it. You crazy. <laughs> You crazy, man. This jump shot working right now. Right now. If I, pull, if, I pull, if I pull this thing out, it get dark outside, Terrence. It get dark outside. Start raining, man. Start raining out here, man. The beautiful thing about doing interviews like this is that if you want to show me doing your jump shot, we can end the interview with a couple J's. So however you want to end this interview, we Oh, it's can do nothing. It. Oh, it's nothing. It's right outside. It's nothing, man. I walk right out there when we done and show you what everyone's talking about. How's it been going? <laughs> How's it been going during this quarantine for you, man? Oh, it's going great, man. It's um, you know, obviously it's been a um it's been a really humbling experience for a lot of people, you know, including myself. And um this time down has been one of those moments where, you know, the first week or so you were kind of in the like, oh yeah, this is crazy and all that. Then week two, I believe, like, it really hits you where you're like, damn, okay, I'm sitting down and the world has stopped. Yeah. And um, it really grabbed me a different way this time, man, in terms of, like, understanding what's important. You know, so oftentimes, man, we run around and, you know, you're trying to make money, you're trying to get your project up, you know, everything is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that this pandemic has allowed me personally um, to really reshift and refocus and really remember you know, why you do what you do, which is your family, your health, your life, you know what I mean? And it just, it just took me back, man, to where I needed to be. And, um, you know, every day we waking up praying for everybody and praying for ourselves and, you know, but this is the first, like, probably in 14 years, man, the first time that I've actually completely stopped, you know, yeah. and not did anything movie-wise and just been focused on the family and what I need to do to be a better person. You know, it's crazy. They say the universe will, will whisper uh, until it has to yell at you. And I feel like for all of us, this is the universe yelling at us in, in a way that we've never seen in our yeah. lifetime to force us to sit down and, and, and think things through. Uh, I've been going through an emotional roller coaster. One day I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh man, this is great. It's creative, whatever. Then the next day you'll get hit with a phone call from, you know, your best friend's aunt just passed or, yeah. you know, your, your mom got laid off. It, how have you been mentally uh, throughout everything that's been happening? Because every day we wake up, it's, everything is in flux. Well, I think it's, um, you know, part of, part of what's happening right now, man, which, you know, I, I mean, I don't need to tell you that, but I think when you come from an environment where you're used to post-traumatic syndrome, you know what I mean? Like we are, so many of us are, you know, if you've been raised in the projects, you've been raised in low income housing, if you've been raised where you don't have a lot. Um, we're very, we're very, very uh, adaptable, adaptable to situations like this, where when you're waking up, you're looking at this and obviously you're like, oh my God, I never seen nothing like this. You know what I mean? But at the same time, like I said, you have that energy and that reset button where you're in there like, okay, we're in the house. You know what I mean? This is what we're dealing with now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and now you have to be, you know, the leader of your household. So for me, it's like making sure my daughter understands what's going on. You know what I mean? Right now, like really putting it in her head. Like, yo, this is, this don't happen. You I, know I've what I mean? more parents uh, talking about, I guess, the new math timetables um, and everything happening with math. Because now you're, you're kind of, you've turned into a teacher as well. Yeah, well, you're a teacher, you know, I mean, obviously a leader. I mean, this is those moments, this is teachable moments. You know what I mean? That you can't take anything for granted. You can't take a simple a trip to go to school for granted. Yep. You know what I mean? A trip to the store, a, a movie, you know, all those things. I think we'll be forced to understand that these are things that are, are blessings to us in life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Also, to be able to go outside and speak to people. You know, it's a, it's a deep message here, man, that's going on. And, you know, I had posted a few days ago about, you know, the reality is this could be in, in a, it could be looked at as a judgment moment. You yeah. know what I mean? In yes. terms of life, like, what have you done? What are you about? You know what I mean? What, what, what are you here for? 
like really like answering some questions because all the materialistic stuff that we look, you know, look up to and want to do and all the cool things and the shows and the awards, don't none of that matter right now. And oh, by the way, it don't matter how much money you got, it don't matter what you got in your garage. Don't, you know what matter right now? How healthy are you? Yeah. <laughs> right, you know what matter right now? Like, who are you? What type of person are you? Do you get along with your family? Who cool for you? You know? Yep, yep, yep. Going through the, the phone, and you know, it's you have two people that are at home with their loved ones, and then you got the single folks out there, and it's like you really realize, yo, all of the people that you played, all the people that you didn't hit back, all the people, this is the time where you need people. You know, this is the yeah. time where, like you said, all the judgment from everything that you've done, this is the reckoning uh, during this time. Um, yeah. Where do you think we go from here? You know, it's, I, I was talking with one of my boys and it's like, after this, are we ever going to dap hands the same? Are we ever going to be around each other the same way? Like, where do we go from here? I mean, I think everything's going to return um, to a new normal. You know what I mean? I think the rest of the year is going to be a little bit awkward. I think people are going to really, you know, they're going to be extremists where people are wearing masks all year and still kind of obeying this whole six feet thing. But I definitely think there's going to be, you know, a therapeutic drug that's going to most likely drop here in the next, you know, month or two, which, like I said before, once people understand that you can get this and not just die, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if there's a therapeutic, then I think it allows people to actually have calm um, in terms of like going out and being out, you know what I mean? But I think this is going to be a new normal for us all, man. And, and what I definitely think is going to do is impact people individually about what life is about. You know, some people are going to really understand this moment and some people are not, you know what I mean? And you could just kind of flip through the gram right now, flip through social media right now, flip through Twitter, and you'll see the people that really understand what's going on versus the people that are sitting around being, you know, bunch of fucking idiots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're like, yo, how in, this, how in the world can you, how can you be doing this on your page night in and night out for the last three weeks and not have one moment of hesitation where the entire world is shut down? How could you not be using your platform to actually give some people some energy that's in these dark places? You know, Terrence, because the reality is, you know, me and you got it good right now. We got a house, you know what I mean? You got a backyard, you got the fireplace behind you. But the reality is the world that we come from, man, I was raised in a, a single single, uh, or single room project building. You know yeah. what I mean? So the reality is everybody's in one, one front room. Everybody's sleeping on the floor, on the couch. So how do you deal with that with social distancing? You said that and how we adapt, it just brought me back to growing up. You know, anybody that grew up poor, we know how to ration your food out longer. That's you right. Know, grocery store runs, because you only, you only got paid on the first and 15th. You had yep. to make stretch, you know? Yep. And so yep. we kind of tapped uh, back into that. And as we, we speak about, you know, upbringings, you've been always just a self-sufficient, get it done type of person. And that's how you guys created Hidden Empire. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how this has been for your creative process? Because you haven't stopped coming up with scripts you know, working on your, your next project, and you've even created your own online series, The Black Chair, giving people hope, giving people energy, doing interviews with Jamie Foxx, doing interviews with, with, with Tyrese. Talk a little bit about your creative process. Oh, man, I, I, you know, I, like I said, the first week I was like, damn, what's happening, man? You know, I said, you know, you're taking every vitamin, you can put, put your hand on <laughs> first, first week, yeah, the first week, you, you, yeah, you sniffing oranges, you doing everything you see on YouTube. I'm like, give me more. I need everything I can do. But then after that, after the first week, man, it was like, all right, man, what you going to do at the time? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, what are you going to do at the time? And, and, you know, we're no, you know, we really understand how valuable time is, man. We, we work on a, on a, a very, very uh, visceral clock in terms of being independent artists where well, we never stop. So when we see everybody fall back and people begin to pause, that's when we actually go harder, you know what I mean? And, and this, this thing stopped a huge piece of momentum that we personally had as a company, you know what I mean? We were getting ready to, which is still sitting there, fatal June 19th, you yeah. know what I mean? We're going into production for free agents beginning end of July. You know, we have terminated, which you're starring in, which we starting to set up for July. You know what I mean? We got Meet the Blacks too, which is October. So as an independent company, you go, oh, shit, <laughs> right when it all this stops. Because it took us 14 years to get that train going 100 miles an hour. You yeah. know what I mean? 
But what I did find out, man, was by stopping and really now dotting I's, crossing T's, making sure my free agent script is right, making sure my terminated script is right, making sure my final edits on Meet the Blacks is right. Like, it just gave me more time to perfect what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And also grow a few more things and grow a few more ideas. And like you said, um, my brain is always working. So at night, I'm like, damn, what could, what, what could you do? And, you know, obviously, man, I, I love philanthropy. Uh, we do a lot of that. You do a lot of that with Be Woke. Uh, Robert Smith is a big part of our lives. And uh, I'm always trying to figure out how do you give back to people? Like, what do you do? It's not about money, but what type of energy can you put into people that look like us in impoverished areas that's trying to actually get to where we are? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how the Black Chair idea came up, which was like, damn, let me just pick up the phone on FaceTime or IG Live and call everybody I know and have them tell their story about how they got started and all the shit they've been through. Yeah. So, so regular people could hear that and be like, damn, I've been through that. Like, I've had that happen. And you can understand it's not a magic pill that gets you successful. It's basically working your ass off and doing everything you need to do under the sun to be successful and then praying to God that he gives you that one moment to shine. When, when you were hustling your first scripts and trying to get people to believe in it, trying to get it made, and you got told no multiple times uh, in a row. What do you think it was for you that, that let you know that you can actually do this, right? Like, what was the, the thing inside you that said, no, nah, you know what? I don't care about them telling me no. I'm going to keep going. What was it for you? Oh, man, it was just, you know, I think it's just God, man. Um, you got to have faith. And you got to have a lot of determination and belief. And you have to have come from a world where you've been told no before and that don't hurt your feelings. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, man. Sometimes God will put you in positions to where those no's are actually calibrating and strengthening you for the yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, I tell you, man, I was told no for seven years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so finally, after being told no everywhere we went, I basically was like, damn, all right, well, let me just try to figure out how to make my own movie. Mm -hmm. Let me try to find my own money and make my own movie. And through those ups and downs, everything that I was able to do on that first film came from the journey and the road that I had traveled. You know what I mean? Being told no. Learning, like, why did they tell me no on this? How come they say yes to this? Like, whatever those things are, you put all that into, you know, that one first film and you make something great. And I've seen a bunch of stories about, you know, I had an opportunity uh, last year. We were doing this series called the Great Great Goose Series with Jamie Foxx, and we had an opportunity to sit down with The Rock and and talk to him about, you know, his company, um, I think it's Six Buck Entertainment or Two Buck, whatever it is. And I was like, well, how'd you come up with the name? And basically that's how much money he had in his pocket. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you see these stories and you're like, wow, man. Like, And then you hear like the Kevin Hart stories. You know what I mean? I remember when Kevin Hart was – first taken off and I was trying to make a movie during that time. As a matter of fact, I was, I tried to like send an offer to Kevin Hart. This was like right after um, Soul Plane and all that stuff. And I remember watching him go to the moon, come back down and then wow. regrow himself. That's what life is about, man. But you see what happened with him, which was a blessing and also a beautiful thing, man, is because he had that experience, he now understands how to avoid that experience. Yep. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of people just go to the moon and then when they fall down, they can't get back up. Exactly. You know what I mean? So it's a, just a blessing, man. And that's all a testament to faith. That's all a testament to having goodwill. That's all a testament to believing in yourself when nobody else does. And it makes wow. you an animal. All those stories, you know, they build to you. I always tell people it's, it's much harder to keep a million dollars than it is to make a million dollars. Yes. Because once you have it, if you don't have all of those L's that you had to take throughout those seven years that built your appreciation for it, that built your understanding of it, that built your knowledge base of it, you won't be able to sustain that level of success. So, so that's I right. With you. Right. That's so you're stuck in the quarantine. What are the top five movies everybody should have watched before the quarantine is over? Oh, number one, Black and Blue. Without a doubt. <laughs> Number one, black and blue. Number two, the intruder. Uh, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely putting them two in there. Then I would say number three, um, everybody has had to watch Shawshank Redemption. Mm -hmm. You got to watch that. Um, that's, yep, just yep. Like a, that's just a great film to watch. 
Um, I actually watched, um, rewatched Castaway. That was incredible. I haven't um, seen. I, I haven't okay. seen Cast. I haven't seen Castaway in years. I sat down and watched that one night. Like, damn, this is incredible. Yeah. Um, loved Castaway. And then I would say, man, you got to get one of these. You know, you got to get one of the movies in that speaks to what's going on right now, right? And I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of people really watching Contagion. You know, wow. I actually watched that as well. But I'm gonna say, man, World War Z was pretty dope. Like, I, I, I turned that on. And, uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. It, it's crazy how much uh, some films hold up and how much some don't. You know, The Matrix really holds up. I went back and watched the first Matrix. It's, it's, it says almost like it just came out, how, how good it is. Uh, I, I rewatched The Godfather trilogy. The third one was uh, but the first yeah. two, I mean, and that's Incredible. over 30 years later, still j- just holds up. Supremacy is, is another good one. Yes, man. Yeah, I, you know what? If you make a great film, man, they usually, they usually are, are are timeless, man. You know what I mean? Anything that, to me, anything Michael Mann has touched, or you know, uh, Christopher Nolan has touched. Like uh, some of these guys, man, are so incredible. It's like effortlessly, you know, done, and and those movies are still like just powerful films today. Um, yeah, those are the five I watched. Process part of your filmmaking process has been watching uh, films and angles like what you did for The Intruder when you have that iconic shot uh, of Dennis Quaid in that was stuff you learned you, not from film school but from being a, a, a student of the game. Yeah, well, I've never been to film school. Um, I'm self-taught, so part of my learning how to become a filmmaker was watching every movie I get my hands on and actually watching the making of of those films. And stylistically beginning to find out, like, what did I like about those movies? So, you know, really being a student of film and studying film on my own. What made me want to watch that movie two, three times? Why, did I, why do I love 48 Hours so much? You know what I mean? What, made, what did I love Beverly Hills Cop so much? You know, what are those things that in rush hour where I was like, damn, I want to have that type of energy or quiet place. So part of the, the, the work is watching those films over and over again and then breaking them down and figuring out what, what you're sparking to. So when you make your movies, you know, you have that same type of energy or you're delivering what made you love film. And uh, Intruder was really special for me, man. You know, we made that movie for $3 million or, and shot it in about 22, 23 days. And yeah, man, we you had to definitely have the homage to The Shining. You know what I mean? With Dennis Quaid, where he comes through the door. Like all of those things are moments that you create as a film fan. But at the same time, man, I love like all the early 90s, 2000 movies I'm a giant fan of. So that whole energy, like when Orion was popping. So like RoboCop and, you know, Tequila Sunrise and like I, I, Platoon, like those, that era, that era for me, Predator, Conan, like all that, that energy that was, was around. Dude, yeah, all that energy. I love movies that make audiences talk. You know what I mean? Basic instinct. So a lot of my navigation for film is making movies for audiences. So a lot of times uh, critics don't understand it. Now they're kind of catching on like, oh, this is his style. I really like that. But early on, they're like, why are you making movies that make people talk to the screen, make people jump? Like, damn, well, don't go in that door. Like, I just love that stylistically because I feel like audiences is who needs to go support your film. And if you pay $8, $10, $14 to go to the movies, hey man, we better be entertaining. Exactly. You know what I mean? Did, yeah, right before the pandemic sure. happened, I had went to the movies and seen like four or five movies. I'm like, damn, like, really? Like, I, I wanted my money back. I would never go get my money back. But I was like, you know, like, come on, man. Like, give me give me some heat. How, how do you think this quarantine and everything that's happened is going to affect the film game? It's going to be bigger and better. Um, I think it's an up and down world. Back to the theaters when, once this is over? Oh, 100%. I think because what happens is, You've exhausted Netflix. Yeah. You've exhausted. You've exhausted Hulu. You've exhausted. Those platforms are tremendous platforms, and they, but they were they were to me they were built for Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. You know what I mean? Over time, but no one ever expected. Okay, I'm finna watch Netflix every day for two months. Bro, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> corner of Netflix right now, bro. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Dirty little corner of yep. Netflix. Yeah, so, so they gotta, they gotta, they gotta fill, fill the box back up, 
And meanwhile, people are looking for fresh, brand new entertainment. And there's no escape like the movie theater, man. You know that, man. There's nothing better than a Friday night, chill, hot evening, a big bucket of popcorn, a Coca-Cola, and a dope-ass movie at the theater. There's nothing can beat that, man. You know that? It's just, it's just that dope. You got my mouth where I, can, I cannot wait uh, to get back to life. But it, it is good that we've had some time to watch content, man. I've been on Revolt. I've been watching Joe Button's State of the Culture. You That's know, a show. Show. it's a great show. Just, just checking in on everything, man. Uh, how have you been able to balance um, family with work? Like, do you compartmentalize your day and say, I'm going to do a certain time with the family? Or do you just, it just kind of all flows together? No, it all flows together, man. Family's first, man. You know, we like, the kids are like on us 24 hours a day, seven days a week that, you know, so we're basically finding a corner to get to, to do a little bit of work here and there. You know what I mean? But the blessing has been the fact that you can mix the two. You know, normally, normally I'm on a plane, you know, I've been, I've been technically flying from Northern California to LA for 14 years every week, twice a week. Oh, wow. So that that's my grind, right? So for me, it wow. hit differently. Yeah, it hit differently because now I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, I'm just at the house with the kids. Like they on the FaceTime call with me, they on the Zoom calls. Like I don't care. <laughs> I'm like the kids are here, so it don't matter. But it's been less a blend of both. And it's been actually really cool, man, to see, you know, that you could actually get just as much work done with your family sitting right there. And you know, me, man, I'm one of them guys. I don't really care if you see my kids on the on the phone or we in here, man. That's what it is. Well, nobody does a pitch like Deion Taylor does a pitch. So, <laughs> you out there. So when, when, when I met you, I'm in, uh, I'm in Hawaii shooting a, a TV show. Uh, D was – what was you there? You was filming something, a rap. You was at a press junket. You was doing a press oh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of your films. And D calls me out the blue. I got a project. I got, you got to hear about this, this pitch. Jumps on a private jet from one island in Hawaii, flies over with his entire family, ten <laughs> person entourage, touches down. I'm there to pick him up in the in, in the truck, and we just that was one of I mean that was one of our first times. First meet, yeah, yeah. And it was, was it was an incredible pitch. Nobody has a type of energy <laughs> like Deion Taylor hopping off the PJ and then left a couple hours later. I was trying to get you to stay for dinner, in and out. So that just no, we gone. <laughs> how involved your kids are, your family are uh, with your work life because you brought the kids to the pitch, had the whole had the whole family for the pitch. Yeah, man, you got to move like that, man. You ain't got but so much time on earth, man. And I've seen so many people, man, make the make the tragic mistake of choosing one side versus the other. Yep. You know what I mean? And the reality is I do what I do for them. You know what I mean? I do it because I love it, but I also do it because I want to leave something here on earth for them. You know what I mean? But at the same time, ain't no movie, ain't no show, you know, ain't nothing more, ain't nothing more valuable than, you know what I mean? My, my little guys, my, my daughter, like ain't nothing more valuable than them. So at the end of the day, I got to make sure that I'm giving them the time and being with them. You know what I mean? While we do this, so they could experience it, and then one day be like, "Damn, okay, I had to pick up what pops left off, or what moms left off," and uh, that's a that's that's a that's something that I just grew into. You know what I mean? And and I'm happy I did that because I I see so many people wishing they had done it differently. So many people, kids leave 17, 18 years old, go to college, and they still trying to figure out how to get a relationship with them. I'm like, no, nah, we gonna we gonna do it right from the beginning, man. We don't get another chance to do that, so. I love it, man. Well, D, thank you so much. It's always good to check in with you. Uh, I'll be watching your, your show on IG Live in a couple. I'm going to tune in for the Black Chair tonight. I know you got big episodes. When, what night does it come on? Man, we ain't got no night, man. We, we come on we, we come on when I'm like, oh, shit, that'll be fun tonight. Like, we, we come on when we come on, man. Tonight's going to be great, though. We got Lala, Morris Chestnut. King Badge and Charlemagne the God, which I think is going to be really, really cool, man. And like I said, man, T, I, I appreciate you, man. You have, you know, you're one of the, you're one of the few people in the space that I call my brother, man, and that I absolutely love and that I truly appreciate, man. Like I just appreciate you as a person. Um, so many times, man, we we get wrapped up with people that could do something for us. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's not what it's about, man. It's about like, yo, I'm checking on you and telling you I love you, man. It's strictly off who you are as a person and care about you, man. I love what you're doing. I love how you always figure out a way to make shit go. 
You know what I mean? And I, I love the fact that you know how to rub two sticks together and make a fire. Listen. Ain't too many people, ain't too many people know how to do that no more, man. They like, hey, what a gasoline that again? Like, no, you gotta rub these two sticks together. You and me will <laughs> out, man. All right, well, brother, stay safe, stay home, stay quarantined. Yes, sir. Keep you focused, man. I love you, brother, and can't wait to be on a set with you soon, man. All right, T. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Love, bro. Thank you.